All right, uh, it's another quarantine talk because again, we're still under quarantine. Uh, we're excited to have uh, Karthik from Yugabyte here with us speaking today. Um, so he is the co-founder and CTO of Yugabyte. Prior to this, uh, he did his undergrad at IT, IIT Madras and a master's degree in UT Austin. Um, he was one of the original developers of Cassandra at Facebook and also was on the team that brought Facebook into, uh, into Facebook, or brought HBase into Facebook as well. Um, so now he's the co-founder of Yugabyte, uh, and where they're working on making Postgres actually be distributed. So again, the way we'll do this talk is that, uh, like, like every week, um, if you have any uh, questions, you know, just unmute yourself, interrupt, and, uh, and, and say who you are, where you're coming from, and then ask your question, okay? All right, Karthik, the floor is yours, go for it. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Andy. So, um, hey guys, uh, thanks for all being here. Like, maybe we just jump right into it. Um, I'm just going to give like a, you know, the rough overview is as follows. This is how the talk will go. Like, I'll, I'll give like a, you know, five minute or less intro to what Yugabyte is for folks who may not be aware. And then I'm going to go right into every decision point that we decided we're going to support in the database. And a lot of it, as you will see, is centered around Spanner versus uh, Aurora. And uh, we're going to go into, for that decision point, what was the architecture, architectural backing and how did we build the database, right? So again, like uh, Andy said, if any questions, please feel free to interrupt. I have a lot of slides even in the, in, the, in the extra section. I'm happy to go into any area in more detail, but I'm just planning on touching on the various areas, aspects of the system. Okay. So, um, and, and again, I'm, I'm kind of assuming most folks have a fairly good understanding of the space, like given, you know, your students of the area. So if, if any place I'm just glossing over too much, then please let me know. Okay. Just not, all, not everyone's my students. We get random people off the internet. Which is okay, awesome. great, great. Okay, great. Then, then <laughs> people feel free to interrupt, I think is the moral of the story. It'll help everybody stay awake, including me. Yes. So, okay. Um, all right, distributed SQL. So what is distributed SQL? Instead of uh, explaining this over and over again, we thought we'd just make it a simplified phrase. Uh, it is retained SQL with transactions, which you all know are traditional RDBMSs, with three extra properties. Uh, resilience, which means failure should not affect you. Uh, or at least not a whole lot. Scalability, add more nodes in order to do more aggregate processing, whether it's for a number of uh, queries you're able to handle, total storage volume, et cetera. Um, and geographic distribution, which can be as simple as a multi-zone deployment where you're able to survive zone failures or more complicated like a multi-region, multi-cloud hybrid deployment where you have a variety of different things, right? You want an entire region failure or maybe get data closer to your users to serve it with low latency, right? So that's really in a nutshell, um, distributed SQL. So with that definition, Yugabyte is built to be a distributed SQL database with a focus on high performance, which means uh, CC++ throughout the stack, uh, the ability to do low latency serving, or relatively low latency serving, and uh, ability to, do, um, to deal with larger amount of CPU, memory, RAM, heap, etc. Um, it's an OLTP database though, so I just want to call that out. I think I didn't put it anywhere because I just took it for granted, but it is an OLTP database, not OLAP. Um, and uh, it's cloud native, so run anywhere, don't have external dependencies, so Kubernetes, VMs, bare metal, what have you, and it's fully open source, the database itself, so just like Postgres. So our aim is we want to take a Postgres-like functionality and build it for the cloud native era. Um, okay, very high level ar architecture. We, when deciding to build Yugabyte, split it into two layers. There's a query layer on top, um, it's actually a pluggable query layer which supports multiple APIs, and we support two APIs. The YSQL API, which is uh, fully uh, inspired by Aurora and reuses Postgres SQL, and the YSQL API, which is Apache Cassandra compatible in its wire protocol and has some extra features. I'm not going to talk about the YSQL API. I'm going to only focus on the YSQL API, but it is built as a pluggable query layer. And the lower half of the database or the storage layer is inspired by Google Spanner. It's called DocDB. It is a distributed transactional document store, right? Um, so let's keep going again. Very high level overview. If, if you assume that's what a single node Postgres looks like, and you can kind of separate it out into the logical query layer, which is uh, parsing, analysis, read, write, planning, executor, you know, the postman, the postmaster, all of that, those processes. And then there's the layers and components that deal with disk, like the write ahead log, uh, writing component, the background flusher, vacuum, et cetera. Uh, what Yugabyte does is it retains the upper half and it replaces the lower half with DocDB as step one. So you can actually execute the query on any node and you'll be able to distribute and read from any other node below. 
as a step two, we said like, hey, why don't we take these query plans that are generated by Postgres and start pushing them down to the lower layers in order to do execution closer to disk, right? So you, if you're doing, for example, the max or a sum or a count or all sorts of things, you can start pushing down the various uh, sub operations into, the, into the, the respective set of subsets of data in order to do processing. And uh, the third phase is uh, we already have most of what Postgres offers in terms of uh, table statistics. Now, these need to work well, uh, not only with like, you know, larger distributed tables, but also based on geographic location or network latency, right? So, and, and also rewriting the query plan to actually work in a distributed system. So these are the three steps. I'd say none of these steps are ever complete. Like that's the journey of a database. So the steps have different levels of maturity and they would be in the order of those three steps, right? The first step is most mature. The third step is least mature relatively, but all three are in play, right? Okay. Um, so that was the intro, like I said, very brief. Now, uh, what was the, I'm just gonna now talk about why did we build, like we started Yugabyte in 2016 to paint you a picture. Um, Spanner was out, Aurora was already out, uh, clouds were taking off for OLAP. The enterprises were very afraid of the cloud for OLTP. They were like, I don't think it plays in our future. And, but the tech companies were all embracing the cloud, right, for OLTP as well. So this is roughly how it stood back in 2016 when we started. And so why did we build a database, right? That's really the, the one question that anybody that's building a database needs to answer. Why build it? So. The journey was actually full of decisions and all sorts of decisions. And because the landscape is actually fairly nuanced and there's fairly advanced, right? So it's just an interesting journey for us also. Um, the first decision was, hey, there's Aurora, there's Spanner. What are we building? Are we just building an open source version of one of these? Or is it going to do anything better than one of these databases? So in trying to uh, figure out, okay, let's say we had to go back to the drawing board and build the perfect distributed SQL database, what would we do, right? We knew we wanted SQL. We wanted an API that was growing fast so people would actually use us. And we found that Postgres was actually an incredibly popular API and it's not any secret, everybody is picking Postgres, so it's not really a revelation right here. And on the other side, there was Aurora and Spanner. Um, Aurora is, I mean, and these are just their own definitions, a highly available MySQL and Postgres compatible relational database. And Spanner is the first horizontally scalable uh, and consistent relational database service, right? It turns out, and it's, I mean, people can people may have their differences of opinion, but Aurora is definitely way more used than Spanner, right? Like that—that that was the state. It became clear very quickly, right? It's so still tr it's still true today. It's still true. It's still very true. It's still very true. I think, and Spanner is actually a far more complicated piece of technology as well. I right? probably I'm, I'm not like putting down the Aurora guys. They've done great work, but Spanner is harder. So it's, it's more expensive too. It's more expensive too. Yes, it needs a lot of hardware. It's very expensive. Yes, seriously. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Okay, so we said, okay, let's really compare these, right? Like that was the high level comparison. But if you start looking at each of these rows, right? What did Aurora do that Spanner did not and vice versa? And why did Aurora get picked? Well, the first thing is in the query layer, Aurora reuses PostgreSQL and MySQL as its query layer. So it said, let me start with the code base. Let me not build something new. Google Spanner said, I'm gonna build something new. It's a distributed system. You need to learn to deal with a distributed system. I'm gonna build something new. Now, the second thing was, how do you achieve that, right? Like the feature depth that is supported by Aurora, thanks to, thanks to its reusing the code base, is really high. It supports most of the RDBMS features that you would want, right? And Google Spanner is pretty low, right? When it started out, in fact, I don't know if folks know, it didn't have an insert statement. You'd actually had to you know, use APIs. And they recently added uh, like foreign keys, for example, just a few months ago. And these are considered very foundational to SQL, right, almost. Uh, fault tolerance, they both do fault tolerance. That is the one thing that Aurora exists to make it, make it operationally easier and fault tolerant. Now on the horizontal scalability and distributed transactions front, Google Spanner actually really shines. It's able to aggregate data onto a bunch of nodes and use all of their CPUs. Aurora sends all of the reads and transactions to a single head node, right, which has to deal with it. And finally, the global transaction replication paradigm, Aurora is asynchronous. So you can start doing async replication to remote databases. Google Spanner is synchronous with read replicas, which means you don't have to deal with, say, uh, I mean, the read replicas are still a part of the same cluster, but, you know, it still sends data. It's not a part of the raft or Paxis uh, voting group, right? It's just an observer. So the most interesting features of Aurora that make it really take off like a rocket is the feature set and ecosystem adoption, right? Like it, it just really supports the ecosystem. You don't, even though you may have to change some things because it's a different design point, 
most of your learnings as a developer and most of the stuff you're trying to do as an app just work, right? So we absolutely wanted to retain that. And we said, like, we're going to build Yugabyte to not give up anything if possible. So just get every, all the good stuff onto the right if possible. And let's see if we can design a system that does that. So that meant we wanted to keep the high, the reuse of Postgres slash MySQL. And we picked uh, Postgres, of course, and we'll talk about it in a second. And uh, we, we also said we wanted to reuse and offer most of, the, most of the features, almost all of the features, or at least a very high degree of features that Postgres has. We want to keep Spanner's horizontal scalability and distributed transactions. And we didn't want to give up on either because, you know, the old school, uh, and, and we, we are open source database, but also a commercial company, right? If you go look at most of the RDBMS deployments out there, they use Golden Gate and Master Slave replication to decrease both read and write latency, but you're okay with a little bit of eventual consistency across these two geographies, right? So we wanted to keep that and we wanted to keep it for, uh, keep the read replica and synchronous replication for the forward looking applications as well. Right? So that, that pretty much formed our you know, design doc, kind of what, what we had to build. What is the default for the web replication scheme you use in Yugabyte today? Uh, uh, the default is synchronous. So inside a cluster, it's synchronous. Across clusters, you can do asynchronous replication. So I mean, there's no default. You have to set it up in that sense. Uh, so two independent Yugabyte clusters can asynchronously replicate data to each other. And within a cluster, you can add nodes that are read replicas. So we support all of that. But the simplest deployment paradigm is a three node cluster with replication factor three. That's the simplest recommended deployment paradigm. And, and presumably that's the bulk of what your customers are using is synchronous. So yes, the, I mean, without synchronous, cluster. yeah, yeah. Without synchronous, I think nobody uses Yugabyte today. Like, it doesn't make sense. But yeah. in addition to synchronous, there are people using both read replicas and async replication. So both of it occurs, but that's always in addition. So if no synchronous, then I don't think Yugabyte's interesting. RDBMS has really solved it well, so yeah. we don't have a place there. So. Okay. So okay. Um, okay. So decision number two, right? Now that we decided this is what we want, do we reuse or rewrite Postgres? I think it's very interesting that you know, Andy was just mentioning about the, the cycle that goes through, right? It's not an easy decision. So we actually started the rewrite path. Um, we spent five months on this and, uh, and said, you know what? We're not going anywhere. So we got to throw this away and start again. But anyways, that kind of gives you an answer on which way we went with it. But let's say you go, you log into PSQL, PSQL and you do slash D, right? What do you think the command looks like? The original, the, the, we thought like, hey, we support a few data types, you know, support tables, bingo, and add one data type every month, and we're in business. In n months, you'll get most of it completed, right? Well, it turns out that the query to list a table looks like that, right? Like, so, or like, okay, man, I, I didn't know about too many case statements in SQL. I've never written one personally. And, uh, you know, it has all the, you know, aliasing and your where clause, in clause, you know, all sorts of built-in functions. Or like, you know what, it's going to take us like years to just support this one list tables command, which is not, you know, not very encouraging as a company. So, well, we then looked, peeled the onion a bit more. And we said, like, there's a heck of a lot of functions that people really care about from the RDBMS world, right? Like starting from like, you know, a dizzying array of all sorts of expressions, operators, built-in functions, you know, all these expression and partial indexes to all the way to stored procedures, triggers, user defined types to, to you know, extensions, foreign table wrappers, like what have you, right? So we said like, yeah, we're not getting there in time. We're not going to be able to build all of this stuff if we just rewrote the whole thing. So we said, we're going to reuse the whole thing, right? We're going to reuse the code base. And since it's a very permissive code base, which makes the case to pick, which made the case for us to pick uh, like Postgres over MySQL and retrospectively, it's, it was a good decision because Postgres's SQL support is actually much more advanced than what MySQL has from what I understand. Um, anyway, so Yugabyte actually supports most of the features shown in the previous screen, right? Today in a distributed scalable factor. Now, it may not all be performant, like because Postgres does various things and there's a lot of curveballs that we have hit through, which makes an interesting talk in itself on what are the things that an RDBMS does that doesn't work in a distributed world. And we had to go and block and tackle each one of those. And we're still doing a bunch of those, but we are able to support the feature set. So that's, I mean, yes, that's, I agree. That's an entire talk. Can you give an example of, of, of the last slide? Like, like from your checklist, which one was the hardest one to make distributed? I think, oh. um, let me see. Uh, I think these were not hard. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, it's, it's always the stuff beneath the covers, right? Let's take stored procedures, for example, right? Or, yes. or even like, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't matter. It happens in a bunch of places. So Postgres has, for example, a bunch of system catalog tables, like for example, a table called PG statistic. 
Okay. Yep. Now, every function call that you make, it doesn't know if it is a built-in function or not. So if it is a built-in function, it can cache that list. If it's a user-defined function, it needs to go look it up from the catalog. Yep. Now, Postgres does a lookup because it's local, right? Like now translate that lookup every time it comes to a remote lookup. Yep. And Postgres, because it's local, can do negative caching to say this doesn't exist until, of course, it does. Now, in a distributed system, negative caching is a little harder to do because, you know, while you're negative caching, somebody could have introduced a type and now you're screwed, right? So, yep. so that's an example of where, for example, a lot of queries going to one node would end up hitting a central lookup of the, you know, of the same name because the distributed workload is looking up the same function call. Yeah. Um, and you're going and looking it up in the catalog and the catalog actually happens to reside only on a single node, right? And so now you get into the situation of how do you distribute and keep the cache consistent versus do you do the lookup? So it's kind of one of the examples, right? There's a number of such examples where, you know, in, unintentionally just bad things happen in a distributed system. There's actually a blog I wrote about it on even pushdowns, like pushdowns, like if we didn't do it the right way by changing the Postgres execution plan, they have yeah. a huge impact. So if you can, you can just search for uh, five pushdowns, Yugabyte, you'll be able to find like an account of five different things, including how it helps speed up performance. So. Is your catalog, what does your catalog look like? Is it just the regular Postgres like tables or is it something that you extract it's, it's Postgres like tables. It's Postgres like tables that sit on top of uh, a tablet, I think we'll, we'll yeah, DocDB tablets, which are yeah. replicated and highly available. Yeah. I think, yeah, that was, it was another interesting realization there. We uh, were just creating one tablet per table, right? I mean, how bad could that be? It turns out, can anybody guess how many tables and relations Postgres would have in its catalog? Can anybody guess? Oh, we, we know this because we, we implemented it. Um, okay, yeah, you guys know it. Okay, never mind. It's not a fun audience. Come on. It's, <laughs> it's 279 or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, not a, the database was barely able to keep up with its own catalog on day one. So we had to build a, a feature to multiplex all of this into a single tablet because they each have maybe 20, 30 rows. So. But it's, I mean, a bunch of them are views. Like PG tables is a view on top of PG yes. class. So like, That's right. It's not like you materialize all of them. But no, we don't need to materialize all, but it's still a big number though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Each, each with just a handful of rows. So um, anyway, so, um, so here's what we did. We said, let's take Postgres. Uh, we wanted to reuse the upper half of Postgres and then rip out the lower half and replace it with our own storage. So we said, okay, we're going to have our DocDB at the lower, lower half, which is a distributed you know, document store. And we'll map each of the tables to document tables, each row to a document, so on and so forth underneath. And we're going to make the changes to the various parts of the upper half of Postgres, you know, that actually, I mean, is, uh, I mean, this diagram is all pretty, but reality is nowhere close. And uh, the changes are not restricted to those small boxes. It's actually a lot more invasive than that. But, but in any ways, the, the theory was, let's go make these changes in order for it to uh, natively start running on top of a distributed system. Right? So the aim is your app can now connect to any node. The nodes are able to talk and push down code or pull up data, whatever they need to do in order to execute. And if a node dies, you're okay because the, the system underneath is fault tolerant and replicated like Google Spanner. And the system above is, is kind of stateless. So you could just continue your, you know, your uh, query in, on a different node. Okay, so that was as far as getting the database running. Now, decision three was we still needed to figure out how we're going to do single row uh, replication, and we picked Raft for that. I mean, we had implemented Paxos before in our lives in Facebook for a couple of things, and this was before Raft was, was like well accepted and, and a thing. So, and Raft is far simpler, so we said we're going to go with that. The additional advantage from our point of view that Raft gives is it, it formalizes uh, membership change, which is pretty critical if you're actually dealing with adding nodes, removing nodes, changing machine type, a number of operations that you have to make zero downtime. So inside Yugabyte, every logical user table is split into a bunch of tablets. How you do the split is actually things we give you control over, like you can do a hash-based sh sh sharding or you can do a range-based sharding. We give you the ability to do both. Um, each shard is now replicated into uh, a set of nodes, as many nodes as the replication factor. So if replication factor is three, you take one of these shards called a tablet and then put it across three nodes and use Raft to replicate data, which will internally elect a leader. And uh, it's all the rights are going to hit the leader. It's going to go to a majority in order for it to, I mean, just Raft, right? standard Raft. So this gives you single row linearizability, right? Like across. And uh, the thing about Raft, at least what it says is uh, you need to establish your leadership before you serve reads, which means effectively it'll look the same as reaching, to all, reaching out to all your peers, getting one vote, and then serving the read, which is incredibly slow. 
So we said like, that's not going to work specifically for our geo distributed aspect of the database. So uh, one of the changes we had to do was to implement leader releases, which raft act paper actually calls out as in, in, a, in a line, it says, or oh, you could do this, but it turns out that's a heck of a lot of work to actually get it right. So this is something that we implemented a lot of interesting learnings, uh, trying to implement that and still make sure we are reasonably defensible against, you know, clock skew and all of that stuff. Right. So, um, uh, but anyways, yeah, we, uh, we look at a we used like the monotonic clock and we did a bunch of stuff in order to make sure we are a little resistant to uh, clock skew changes and so on. But uh, our reads also therefore get handled by the leader and we, because of the fact that it uses a lease. And uh, among the other enhancements that were needed are these, uh, the usage of monotonic clocks. Uh, it's because your software clock can jump, right? Like because due to NTP adjustments. So we actually use monotonic clocks and, uh, uh, transmit only deadline times as opposed to uh, absolute time. So everybody computes time and then we adjust for the clock drift within a small time window, which is much safer than clock skew, which is like a forever tracking thing, right? So, so uh, what is that window? What do you uh, mean? It's, it's two seconds. Uh, the, the least time is two seconds. So we're just correcting for clock drift within a two second window. And we say that the, and, and this is different from the time it takes to detect a failure, which is the number of missed heartbeats. This is mostly the lease establishment period, right? Yes. So the missed heartbeat period for us is uh, six missed heartbeats of 0.5 seconds. So it's about three second failover time. So it's still, so you're still fine, right? Like in that okay. sense, you don't hold on to the lease and screw things up a whole lot when, it, when this situation hits. Okay, so group commit was the other thing without which you're like a sitting duck in the water, right? Like, so you have to do a lot to improve performance by combining a lot of operations. And that means inside the raft batch, you'll have to order operations and do a bunch of stuff inside to make it work right. So uh, group commits is just a couple of things. There's a whole, a bigger list out there. Um, okay, so. You, you, you seem a bit flip about like, oh yeah, it's raft, it's, it's a couple of things. Like it's, it's, a ma it's a major engineering undertaking. It's not. It, it is, it is. It's a bit glib about it. Like that's, that's not easy. No, that's not easy. That actually, we spent a lot of time on it, to be honest. And we have, I have a partially written design doc that I'm intending to complete. It's in our GitHub repo. Again, happy to share uh, some of these, but, but it is actually a difficult thing because some of these things are even hard to test for. And like, you know, it's just so probabilistic. You just have to keep exposing yourself to many, many hours of runtime, right? And, and, fa and induced failures and so on, right? So yes. Yeah. So yes, thanks. Thanks for that, Andy. Keeping me straight. I'm just, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So anyways, so um, the next decision was now we had like, I mean, so far, if you've just followed the train along, like we said, reuse Postgres, uh, we're going to make it uh, like we're going to use RAF for single row consistency. Now, how are we going to store data in a single node, right? We wanted to optimize for SSDs, uh, which means RocksDB was the thing to work with. And we actually knew RocksDB code fairly intimately because when we were at Facebook, we were the team behind HBase and RocksDB took LevelDB as a starting point, took HBase algorithms and put it inside LevelDB in order for an HBase-like system to run on SSDs, right, for our MySQL tier. I mean, we tried HBase directly under the MySQL tier and GC was just giving us hell because SSDs were really fast. So we decided Java is not the way to go, right? So anyways, so the question was, do we use it as a black box or not, right? And we said, like, after looking at what we needed to do, we needed a number of um, enhancements to, for uh, RocksDB to work uniquely in the way we were using it because a single node could have multiple tablets, as shown below. Each tablet is backed by its own RocksDB. So now we needed many RocksDBs to coexist on a single node and kind of share resources amongst them while still behaving nicely as a part of a coherent system. That was issue number one. Issue number two is we wanted to optimize RocksDB uniquely for the access patterns that we were getting from the layer above, right? So instead of just using it as a key value store, which doesn't understand, for example, a column delete or a document delete or like a TTL expiry of data, we wanted to get a little more invasive and start making those changes. Finally, I mean, and that, that was not it. We, in, in addition, we wanted to convert the key to value to key to document, right? That was another change. And we wanted to take out the write ahead log of RocksDB completely because we had raft log on top. So what is the point of a double write ahead log? But if you take out a write ahead log, you take out MVCC because they're tied at the hip, right? So that means we hoisted both the MVCC and the write ahead log above. So at this point, we said reusing RocksDB as a black box is not a good idea. So we went ahead and, and um, integrated that component deeply into the database and started making changes. And, and we still are, right? So to some extent, but all of this is, all of what you see here is done. Okay, um, so uh, the DocDB's 
local store uh, like effectively just deals in documents. So it takes a document and then puts it into some sort of a format. And because it's a multi API uh, store, like the store adheres to multiple APIs it caters to, it has a different way of laying out data where you could have an init marker. You may not need an init marker because you would replace the whole sub document. You may not replace the whole sub document. There's just like various things around how we play around with the exact representation of, you know, whatever you're modeling on top. Right. All right. So, I mean, this is a, a little more in-depth view into how uh, like the uh, like the data, data encoding is done at the DocDB level. Um, I mean, at the DocDB level, everything just looks like a document key and a document. And because you want the ability to insert, upsert, or replace like at a fine-grained level in addition to a whole sub-document or document being changed, uh, the way it's written is it is actually a doc key and then there are its sub keys or you know its attribute and then uh, the hybrid time like uh, the time at which this document was written which actually ties to raft uh, in some sense because you know hybrid time is what we use I and mean, we will talk about that in a little bit um, and finally the value itself is also um, encoded right like using some rocks db encoding and depending on the API that this flows through, a lot of the bits of how to serialize data is a pass through possibly from the system on top. So for example, if you're talking PostgreSQL, the value is encoded like PostgreSQL, right? Like the same um, like uh, serialization format. So we don't have to keep serializing and deserializing every time. However, for the, the primary key part, the doc key part, we do reserialize because we want to maintain a byte sortable order that is natively understood by the system. Why? Why store as a document? Why not? Why not a tuple? Like, like, because you're not really. Like, what advantage are you getting? But like, what aspect of using like a, a JSON document are, are you exploiting in the system versus like a tuple? Um, I think uh, the the main thing is uh, like there's a few things uh, in a, inside a document. You can we can start adding like indexes and short range scans and a few things. So that's number one. Um, like uh, number two is there are areas where you have to delete. Uh, like a sequence of entries in the database below with a single write as opposed to multiple writes. Like, for example, you may have an array that you want to delete or you may have like uh, a, an entire sub document that you want to suppress. So I think those are the reasons why we started going down the document path because we wanted the ability to understand or skip or seek or operate on a bunch of KVs at a time, right? So as opposed to just a pure tuple where those things may get a little more complicated. Hold on, it, it, tuple is, is, would be less complicated because you know exactly what's there. You don't have to go look at the document and figure out what, what schema does it actually have. Oh, I think, okay. So I see your, I see your question. So in that sense, we, it is like a tuple. So in that sense, it's not a document. The schema is enforced on top. Uh, the, okay. the doc DB itself doesn't know about schema. The schema is, because it depends on the query layer you come from, but the storage layer is neutral. There is no right. notion of schema that it's done above, but even within the document or the, I guess it's a loose notion of a document, like what, what it really means. Like uh, yeah. I think what we're trying to say here is mainly the fact that these are not tuples that are completely devoid of each other. The way they're laid out on disk and the way they're serialized and written, they actually have a bigger meaning, right? As opposed to just it being a tuple. And uh, similarly, which, which pieces of this, of this representation do you put, for example, into a Bloom filter, or which pieces do you want to put into your index block, or just things like that that start to matter? I think those are gonna, that's, that's, that's orthogonal, whether it's a tuple or a document. No, you're right, I think, uh, yeah, I think in, at a high level, you could describe this as tuple also. Uh, okay. it's just, I think the, 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 maybe the way to explain it in that case is there is a relationship between a sequence of these tuples, right? Like as opposed to them all being independent tuples. So you could have a, um, like a doc oh, key attribute. I get it. Cause you want, you want to do the physical de denormalization. Exactly. Scenario. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Right. Exactly. Okay. Right. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I get it. All right. So, okay. So that's that on the storage layer. The next decision was like, be like Spanner, but don't be like Spanner. Don't require atomic clocks, right? So, like people don't have those lying around. So anyways, so where, does it, where do atomic clocks come in, right? Like uh, we, by use of raft and by use of the monotonic clock, we're already okay for linearizability on a single row key path. Uh, it really comes up only when you're starting to do multi-tablet reads, like a select star. So anytime you hit multiple tablets inside a single operation, right? You can call it a transaction that either updates or reads or does anything across multiple tablets. That's when this starts to, to actually matter. 
Now, one thing that we did inside um, Yugabyte like early on is the ability to distinguish between single row and multi-row access paths, and they're treated differently, right? So the single row access path actually takes what is called a fast path and goes straight and makes the updates on the tablets that it desires. The multi-row um, like path takes a more generic distributed transactions path. We'll look at how distributed transactions work, but I mean, I think folks may already know why, but like you need the notion of time correlation across nodes in this case, right? Why? Because when you're operating across keys that belong to different shards, which themselves could live across different nodes, um, you will perform updates that could go to different raft groups, but you will need to tie it to some notion of time. I mean, I'm calling it physical time, but it's some notion of time, right? And all nodes need to agree on time. And that's where like, you know, some sort of a, uh, global time service starts to come in, right? So using a physical a physical or an actual physical clock, right? And too many overloads of time here, but like using a hardware-based solution for this would mandate you to have a couple of atomic clocks that you have to stick into your system. Um, I mean, an atomic clock or true time service is nothing but a highly available and globally synchronized clock service with very tight error bounds, right? So seven milliseconds in the case of Spanner um, or, or something thereabout, right? So where you're okay waiting that, that amount of time. Now, it turns out most people will tell you that they don't really have atomic clocks. So, you know, if you're, if you're telling me I need to use an atomic clock, I'm going to find a different database. And most of the physical clocks that people have are never synchronized. So if you look at NTP, its synchronization window is like about 150 to 200 milliseconds. Right? And if you're building a high performance database that takes a minimum of 150 milliseconds to serve a response, we're not going to go very far. So we said we're going to adopt hybrid logical clocks, which means we'll let NTP do its thing, 150, 200 milliseconds, and we will tack on inside the synchronization window a logical component in order to figure out, you know, how, like it's, it's almost like a Lamport clock, right? Like you kind of figure out the causality of events. Now, further that, couple that with, like, and that's, and, and every time any node communicates with any other node for anything, we will exchange time so that they can keep their times in, like they, they can keep their um, logical times as well as their physical times kind of loosely correlated. And uh, every time a, a transaction is done, we will be very fine grained about exactly what nodes it needs to touch and what is the causal chain that it needs. So we'll be as good as we can get in order to detect um, that we don't need to establish causal relationships for certain types of transactions without obviously sacrificing correctness. Now, in, and kind of minimize the number of places where we cannot tell if there is a causal chain or not. And it still happens in a few places. So in those cases, we'll have to deal with it as a conflict and we'll have to restart, right? So, so that's, that's really the, the logic of, of how we go about it. So it's just a standard hybrid logical clock and the rest of it is to figure out how to avoid conflicts as much as possible. Is your HLC based on the, the Buffalo guys one that CockroachDB also uses or you, you have something different? You no, it's, it's based on the same. It's based on got the it, same. Yeah, it. It's the, the Buffalo, yeah, same thing. Okay. Um, Okay, the next, other, the next major decision was how were we going to do distributed transactions? Because, okay, so now you have some sort of a software defined uh, global clock, right? But, but so what? There's still an actual algorithm that we need to figure out. So we picked uh, Google Spanner-like design, like uh, as opposed to a percolator-like design because we, didn't, we wanted to be geographically distributed and it's based on a few assumptions. So um, basically the system uses a two-phase commit with hybrid logical clocks in order to commit data. Um, like distributed transactions that where the clock is kind of distributed are, are better, more scalable as opposed to going to a central issuing authority. Um, it's also better for multi-region deployments, which is actually the other big thing. So built into this uh, are the assumptions on why we went this way. The assumptions that we made were firstly, global deployments will get very popular. So picking a system where you have a timestamp Oracle kind of give times, like time values for you is going to become a problem in these deployments. And the second thing is clock sync in clouds will get better, right? Like Google built uh, true time, but the other clouds are not going to sit around. And, and when we started, that's what we hypothesized. And they haven't. They've started building stuff like Amazon and Azure have time sync service and so on. And our, our bet is that over time, as these type of services get built, it's just going to keep getting better and better. And uh, obviously, we should not use atomic clocks, which we already looked at. Um, okay. So... Uh, Yugabyte's transaction manager is a fully decent or distributed transactions are fully decentralized. So there's no single point of failure. Any node can act as a transaction manager. 
Uh, and the transaction, any ongoing transaction is tracked as a part of a transaction status table, which itself is a distributed table. A transaction has three states, pending, committed, or aborted. And reads are served only for committed transactions. If a transaction is aborted, it's ignored. If a transaction is pending, then you have to do, uh, you cannot serve it in the reads, but what you can do, I mean, and it depends, right? You just have to run through your conflict resolution rules to figure out what you can based on, you know, what is the isolation level and so on and so forth of, the, of what is going on. So speaking of isolation levels, Yugabyte supports serializable and snapshot isolation. I think for, I think for, um, Assuming folks are familiar, if not, like, please do ask. Uh, but anyway, serializable detects read-write and as well as write-write conflicts. And uh, snapshot isolation detects write-write conflicts only, right? And uh, the default that we have, so it maps to the various, uh, like serializable obviously maps to serializable in Postgres. And the rest of them map to uh, like, you know, repeatable read, read committed, read uncommitted. Everything else maps to snapshot isolation, right? And... Uh, the default in Postgres is snapshot, which is the default in Yugabyte as well. Did anybody uh, ask you to get like for read uncommitted or the lower the lower ones? Or just, no, yeah. not so much actually. No, not that's what yet. I figured. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, read only transactions are lock free, um, right? So uh, because we use MVCC and so on, so we don't really have to. At least only a shared lock, not an exclusive lock. So this is a simple distributed transactions code path. I mean, like let's say the client wants to. You know, update a couple of keys. Key one equals K one equals V one. K two equals V two. First thing you do, and this is the the more theoretical view, not the optimized practical view. Um, so it hits any node, which is the transaction manager, which will go and create a status record, which is replicated using Raft, um, in order to track that transaction being in progress. Now, in the real world, the transaction manager and the tab the tablet server one and two co-located on the same node because it picks a local transaction uh, tablet and the transaction status record is pre-created so it doesn't have to do that round trip also so all of this just goes away in the real world but in any case like uh, it does that and then it starts acquiring provisional record it starts writing provisional records to kind of acquire locks on each of the rows it wants to update so it's going to make each of those updates and which are in turn replicated using raft and finally it's going to flip a bit in the transaction status table, which says, hey, this transaction is, can be served now. It's committed. And at which point, two things happen. It responds to the client saying your transaction is successful, obviously assuming that it doesn't conflict with any other provisional record already written. And finally, in the background, it starts flushing all of the, you know, the provisional records and, final, and making them finalized records. So you don't have to keep... So any read that hits... A provisional record now is because it's in pen, it's in a in the pending state has to go look up the status of the transaction to see is it committed or bought it pending. If it's pending, it's going to go apply its conflict resolution rules. If it is um, committed, it'll serve it. If it's aborted, it'll skip it. Right, and you don't want this to happen forever. So the step number six actually flushes this from the status tablet into each of the tablets so that it can then just serve reads from itself. Right. Um, the timestamp of when the transaction is visible is actually the timestamp when it's flipped to commit. So step number four determines the commit time of the transaction. Okay. Um, all right. So um, that's as far as how a synchronous distributed transaction happens, whether it's in a single region, multi-region, multi-zone, doesn't matter. Now I'm going to go to cross-cluster async replication, which is unique of Aurora, right? Like, and so we thought we should bring it into this world because you know, a lot of uh, RDBMS users still like this functionality. Um, so we call it X-cluster because every other word seems to be overused and we just said, let's give it a different name that sounds different and you know, people can just refer to that feature as such. So cross-cluster or X-cluster replication. It allows two independent gigabyte clusters to like replicate data or one way, two ways, both ways, whichever way, um, right? And uh, the assumption here obviously is that the schema on both the clusters are synchronized externally. And that's a limitation for today, right? Like that's something we hope to fix over, like as we work on this feature more, the, the DDL replication is also something we hope to do, but today that's not the case. Um, and uh, this architecture is also the building block for our change data capture feature where, you know, an external system can just arbitrarily subscribe to changes. Um, but obviously in change data capture, there are some nuances where change data capture is a more generalized feature compared to uh, just the cross-cluster replication where you can get changes that are 
um, the after row image, just the delta changes, or the before and after. You can get it in three formats, whereas the X cluster replication only desires the delta, right? It doesn't care about the others. So, but anyway, so it's just a building block for us to support that feature as well. Okay, so guarantees, right? Firstly, the first thing that we guarantee is an uh, in-order delivery of rows to a tablet, right? So, uh, or a row, um, and it applies to so this is the guarantee as far as a non-distributed transaction goes. So we'll talk about what we do for distributed transactions later. Uh, obviously, when two operations that are not touching the same set of rows occur on two different tablets, these are not sequenced relative to each other when it hits the replica cluster, right? So, so that means you could set x equals 1 and then set y equals 2. But in the replica cluster, you could see y equals 2 first and then x equals 1, right? And our belief is it's still usable in this form because, you know, it's a distributed system and people would try to synchronize changes they really care about. Um, so the third thing, and, and so, yeah, that's an okay trade-off to be made for a distributed system. Um, second thing is um, at least once delivery of changes, which means on failures, we'll transparently retry. But the system underneath, like, the way it works is the tablet leader or the query coordinator actually translates the changes to be made into a set of attributes and documents that need to get applied, which will subsequently become item potent, right? So you could keep applying that because it goes with its own timestamp. And so it just like, there's no, nothing wrong in doing in at least once delivery for the internal consumption. Obviously as a change data, as a generalized change data capture, it has its implications, but not so much for this usage. Uh, the next one is monotonic updates, which means that if one of the consumers receives a change uh, for, for a row, then it would no longer receive a change for in an older change for the same row. So that means you'll only get newer changes. You won't get older changes for a given row. Um, periodically, we send a no-op in order to make sure that you know you can kind of keep bumping up the timestamp up to which you have seen data, and so you kind of know up to when your system, your target system, your sync is has caught up. Right? Um, so the next thing is transactions and conflict resolution. Um, so this is the one where your write is not a single row write, it's actually a distributed transaction. Um, but either single row or not, like if there's a transaction, the last writer wins. So you could write x equals 1 in one cluster and x equals 2 in the other cluster. You could have a bidirectional replication stream, and they both will assign their own timestamps irrespective of the order in which these operations happen. The one with the higher timestamp would win, right? And um, yeah, we picked this to simplify how apps are developed as opposed to expose this to the end user and somebody does some conflict resolution rules and so on and so forth. Um, on the, if there is a constraint violation on the sync, right, like then your uh, transaction apply fails. Like for example, there could have been an, an offending write, for example, which violates a unique constraint as an example, right? Like now it will no longer apply and that'll fail. Um, these updates will be dropped. I mean, obviously, uh, exposing the error to the end user, that, that's an orthogonal thing, but you'd have to make a decision and we just like drop it today. Um, we decided against exposing conflict resolution to end users because the system just gets too hard. It's not a practical use case. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just like how people work today, right? So based on the, the programming frameworks that they have. And uh, we are working on our handling distributed atomicity. So on the sync cluster or the target, uh, if one row, which is a part of a larger transaction lands, it's put into a waiting to commit state. It's not committed immediately. And uh, once all of the operations that are a part of the transaction across all the tablets in the target sync cluster are applied, then that's now allowed to be visible and it moves forward. So some of these features are still in progress, specifically the last one about handling distributed atomicity across the um, asynchronous replication stream. Right, so, okay, so the key components here, every, uh, every node on the source cluster has a producer. Every node on the target cluster has a consumer. I mean, this is all a part of the same process, but logically speaking, those are the roles that they play. Um, and I, again, I'm not going to go into too many details because uh, yeah, I just want to you know, try to see if I can wrap up soon also. Uh, but in any case, so there is a CDC stream and there's the notion of bootstrapping where you need to catch up on like if you started a brand new cluster that's a target, it needs to you know, kind of bootstrap the data from the source cluster. So a unidirectional replication looks like this. You could, you could replicate from an M node cluster to an N node cluster, no problem. All of the Ps are producers on the source. All of the Cs are consumers on the sink. 
and uh, they'll form their own pairings based on you know which guy has what tablet and they discover who they should send data to and so on right and if the data goes to the wrong node it can forward it but ideally we'd like them paired in a way that it is correct for the most part so if there's a failure and for a while you're going to the wrong guy that's okay but if we eventually want the system to correct itself right so um, yeah so this is about establishing a unidirectional stream from one side to the other obviously with the assumption that the you know table ddls look the same and they've been externally synchronized at least for now and um, bidirectional is just like two independent uh, like async unidirectional streams with protection for the echo chamber problem right like where you send something and it keeps coming back and going back at infinitum right that's the only protection that you need in this case um, the metadata and checkpoints are all stored inside the system inside the source cluster so each source cluster uh, tracks each of the you know, it has a system set of system catalogs in addition to what Postgres has. It has a UUID for each stream. It has a bunch of registered subscribers. It checkpoints per subscriber. It's a coarse checkpoint, so that's that's where the at least one supplies. Sometimes you could have repeated data and so on and so forth. And this replication is done in a batch and you know and what have you. Okay, so I had this. Uh, yeah. two, two quick questions. Is yeah. it, are you guys doing a push or a pull model for replication? It's a pull model, but uh, we could do either. I mean, it's just like uh, like we talked about this, and we're doing a pull model right now. Um, but it's just moving the like. It's just about like you know, there's a subscriber and a producer, right? Like, uh, yes. go back to this diagram. It, it's just about. Oops, sorry, yeah. If we moved all the consumers also to the left and co-located them with the subscribers, it'll look like a push model. But we're not doing that. We're doing a pull model right now. Got it. And what is the binary serialization format that you're using? Are you using protobufs? Are you using flat buffers? What do you, what do you guys use to send the data? Or is it custom? It is, uh, it is the binary for this is protobuf. Okay. It's protobuf, yeah. So it's right. protobuf internally. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we have tried to talk to end users for there's the CDC to see how we, they, want, they want it exposed. And I think protobuf is not good for that kind of a, like an end user consumption model. So we're thinking of extending SQL itself to be able to allow that. But in, inside the cluster, the far more performant way is protobuf for us to transfer okay. this data. Okay, cool, awesome. Yeah, and, but uh, Bootstrap doesn't go through protobuf. Bootstrap is just uh, disk file segments that moves to the initial bootstrap. Like when you have data in a cluster and you first start the async, that's, it's almost like a backup restore kind of. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll go to testing Yugabyte. Like what do we do? So we have a fairly sophisticated, it looks like we put a lot of effort into testing. Like, and it's like sometimes when I was writing this slide, I realized like it's almost, uh, starts rivaling how much work you do in the database so <laughs> so in any case like we have a a reasonably long ci cd pipeline so uh we once once you put your enhancements fixes etc it goes through this long pipeline before a release candidate comes out the other side after which there's specific manual testing done depending on the exact feature you're delivering etc cetera, etc cetera. there's like there's, you can never i mean you can try to automate it all but it never happens in reality you can only do so much um, so some of the uh, key aspects of our thing, right? Like we have a lot of component unit tests and uh, uh, like ASAN, TSAN and deterministic failures, like known failures that we want to encode, like what happens when this node goes down and that right happens and before it acts, this thing goes out. So these are all kind of like processes inside a single system or threads that we try to quiesce or kill or do the, do the bad stuff that would happen. So that like, you know, we are, we, we are sure we kind of will work against the, the known bad cases we want to protect against. And if a new bug comes in, we try to encode it in this kind of a system. And uh, sometimes you have to go and inject code in some critical path, which are test only code paths, which get, you know, kind of flipped on only in this unit test mode and so on. So we've done a bunch of that kind of stuff. Um, our, these, the, the first three boxes here, right, they run upon every diff upload. So uh, like one of our engineers, they, he writes a diff and he uploads it. Uh, and he has controls on selectively which subsets of tests he can select, but all the details aside, it's going to auto bid for a spot instance on GCP or AWS. I think uh, right now we're using GCP. We moved from AWS though, so we're okay with either. And it does spark based parallelized testing and it kind of reports the result and the failures and so on back to that diff, right? So that you know that you, you absolutely have guarantees on the unit tests having been run. Right? What, what does it mean to be spark based parallel testing? What does that mean? 
Oh, it's just that like our unit tests are so many now that like they take like many hours to run. So we, in order to parallelize that, we had to actually change our unit test framework to run. Like instead of like one unit test having a lot of subtests and taking a lot of time, we had to chunk it up into many unit tests that are shorter running in at the same time and kind of distribute them across a set of nodes. And every node in parallel runs a subset of unit tests. So the whole thing finishes pretty quickly. So you're, you're, you're basically using Spark as a poor man's Kubernetes. Exactly. Like, like, okay. It's a parallel. It's more like a parallelization framework. It's like okay. map reduce okay. or parallelization framework. Got it, got it. Yeah. Okay. So like, if, if if you have tests one to hundred, one to five run here, two five, six to ten, and then and so on, run in parallel through Spark. So. But then, and then, so, but this is the manual things. You're saying like, so the developer says, "I'm going home for the day. Run this for me." This is automated. Make... Yes. So he uploads a diff and doesn't do anything else, and it, the whole thing happens, and the results are out before the code reviewer is on it. So. No, but like, but I'm saying like they have to manually upload the diff. The diff has to be manually uploaded, yes. So the okay. developer says, here's a diff. I'm submitting it for code review, which is, of course, mandatory for us. But yes. um, the, once the diff is uploaded, and based on some tags, he can suppress some of these. But I'm just giving you the default flow. Uh, yes. th these tests are automatically kicked off, and the first three stages run. We're using a, and so it bids for a spot instance, runs this whole thing, yes. get, collects the results, puts it up in, a, in kind of a database, and links it to the diff, and says, OK, now it's ready to go. And yeah. so by the time the reviewer is back, they can, he's on the diff, he can check, hey, what's the status of your thing? And then it happens in just like, you know, a few minutes. Like it's not like hours and hours to get this from. Okay. That was the spark point, right? Okay, cool. Right, so the other thing that's good is we are a C++ system. C++ equals high performance, but C++ also equals a heck of a frustrating time debugging, you know, memory issues in production. So we have all of the address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, like a, we run it in multiple different variants using a couple of different compilers and different uh, OSs, including Mac, which is a pain in the ass. Like ask me some other time, I'll tell you about how you cannot put Mac in a CI CD very easily. But anyways, um, so we do all of that also. So which is, uh, which has helped us a lot. It's saved our, it's saved our rears quite a few times. Um, okay. And uh, we run Jepson in a loop, like it's non-deterministic, so it's more exposure based, but that's something that we do because it's you know, just safe. And finally, we have a end user style integration test where it's more a little more black box and like install the database, bring it up, like you know, create, shrink, expand, run workload, just like the various basic operations that you would qualify. These are nowhere as intense as the ones before. Um, like in terms of how much they penetrate and test, but these are really useful to qualify high level user scenarios, right? So we do that. And um, we have like, it says 10 plus, it's a lot more now, this is an older slide, but anyway, so we have a bunch of workloads that we keep testing that are run like through performance regression to make sure our performance doesn't drop more than a certain amount, which is another pain in the ass if you're doing it on cloud machines, but that's a different problem. Like, What is that amount? 10%. Okay, that's, yeah, that's right, yeah. It's crazy, as it's a lot, though, if you're looking at some workloads. So, of course, uh, you know, yeah, this, this is what the, the HANA guys told me this. 10% is what everyone says. Okay. Yeah, 10%. Yeah. I mean, but 10% could be a bad regression, right? So, <laughs> so anyways, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, as an example, right, like the amount of tests and why we had to build the Spark based pipeline is like we have a hell of a lot of tests that we run. This is just the tests from PostgreSQL. Now, we have an equivalent amount for the RocksDB set of tests. We have an equal amount for our raft based tests. And then, so you just see that these tests just add up, right? Like, so uh, this is our coverage on PostgreSQL's own tests that we have ported over by virtue of. And, and it's not because we cannot do more, it's just like time, right? How much can you do given the time? So, as we port, like this is our current state, like we have now gone up a bunch from the previous percentages, but our aim is to get almost every test. And, and also note that the Postgres tests have to be ported in multiple flavors for us because it's a distributed system with hash sharding and range sharding and co-location, just like so many different like flavors in which Yugabyte runs, right? So these are, these are some of the things that we do. So with that, all I'll say is like, we're still early. We're a fast growing project. It's been fun working with a lot of customers and users. Like, um, but you know, if, if any of you guys are enthusiasts, are interested, you know, stars on GitHub, like join our community Slack, et cetera, et cetera. Still early days for us. So, you know, um, yeah. So yeah, that's all I had. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, so again, we're, we're, we're online. So I'll, I'll, I'll applaud for everyone else. Um, so I have a bunch of questions, but I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, if anybody has any questions, unmute yourself and again, say who you are, where you're coming from, and ask it to uh, Karthik.
Okay, nobody. It's you, yeah. Andy. Okay. Um, how long did you guys do any micro benchmark testing for like like smaller components just in C plus plus, or is it only like the, the regressions for the end to end system? Um, for performance, you mean specifically? Yeah, performance regressions. Uh, no, we don't do too many micro benchmarks for performance regressions. Now that you mention it, it's not a bad idea. Like we well, we just do yeah. We we find that they're noisy at least, uh, and that's why we like we started off with ten percent. We we bump that up to for some of them made it like bump up to 75% because they can, for the really short things, even Google benchmark, we're seeing a lot of variation. We don't know whether it's the machines or the, or the, um, or the test itself. Um, what were the complications you had getting the Mac in your CI pipeline? Because we actually struggle with that as well. Yeah, I think um, for starters, like every other flavor of OS is easy to get either through Docker, Kubernetes, VMs or something. Mac is not. Like that's one thing that's been hard. Second issue has been, so the way we do this is, is actually like, I mean, it's a janky system for, it works for us, but not 100% reliably. So the, the best solution we've come up with is we got a bunch of Mac minis and hooked them up and made them a part of if our intranet. And then it's a part of the CI, CD, and that yep. thing doesn't always respond. So just a bunch of stuff. So that's, that's problem exactly what we did, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, then and you know. <laughs> I don't think anybody on this call is from Apple, but Apple does not give any hardware. Like, they don't do any donations. They're very cheap. They don't. They don't, yeah, they yeah. don't, yeah, so, and yeah, and then there's the Mac versions and what you install. It's just like, it's just hard to spin up a pristine Mac environment, right? Like, so. Yes. Yeah, so. All right, do, do, you, do you guys offer Yugabyte as a service yet, or is that then the roadmap? We, we offer, like, we're in, in beta with Yugabyte as a service. So on the commercial side, we have two offerings. Uh, we have a platform product, which is the first one we built, which is used by a lot of our commercial customers. It, it is something that can install in your AWS, GCP, or whatever account, and it can convert it into a managed service completely. So you'll be able to get a DynamoDB or Aurora-like experience because it can spin up nodes, set up security groups, do the whole thing for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that our larger enterprises gravitate towards. And uh, we just uh, recently announced a managed offering for a cloud. We have a free tier. That's all we have that's available for people. And it's because we really have to figure out the pricing and usage. It's just a whole list of auxiliary things to figure out, like more on the business side rather than the core tech side. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, but we did offer. We did we do have one now. So yeah, and we're in the path of getting it into GA and a paid offering. So okay, and then um, I mean the most obvious comparison would for you guys would be something like Citus. Um, I wonder if you can contrast sort of the design decisions that you made versus what they do. I think I think the answer would be you know they were strictly shared nothing, whereas you sort of split the storage and execution layer up again, a la or, or yeah. Spanner. I think uh, it's interesting with Citus. I think uh, in spirit, in in functional spirit, we'll be closer to CockroachDB in terms right. of Postgres reuse. We're closer to Citus, so you can think of us as a hybrid between the two. Postgres reuses um, the lower half of Postgres, sorry, Citus reuses the lower half of Postgres SQL, which means the storage is exactly the same as Postgres SQL. Um, you annotate a shard key that it splits across different Postgres SQLs, and you go through like one of these coordinator nodes which deals with transactions across these different Postgres SQLs, and the replication is still Postgres's own uh, async replication. So this is what I understand of Citus, right? With yeah. Yugabyte, the storage format is completely different. It's Yugabyte's own format. The entire cluster actually looks like a single database as opposed to you sharding it across these many databases and stitching them on top. Right? That's not what Yugabyte does. It's a logical whole database. But it reuses the upper part of Postgres more so than the lower part in order to offer the functional richness. So it's kind of, those are the trade-off points. Okay. All right, my last question is, and then if this, this is a new I'm going to, all for the Davis vendors we have going forward, I'm going to ask the same question. So you, unfortunately, are the first one. Um, okay. If you want me to cut out anything you know, from the YouTube video, we can do this. So be candid as you want. Um, how stupid are your users? Like, how surprised are you <laughs> from the bullshit you have to deal with with them? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's, a, I mean, like, I, I'm only pausing because it's very hard to answer that question because the answer is like, yeah, I think uh, as database enthusiasts, builders, or people knowledgeable of the database, we think something. And like, like I did the same thing when I, you know, started building Yugabyte, or when I started building any of the databases for that yes. matter. It was the same with Cassandra and HBase. But man, people do so many ridiculous things that you'd be surprised. 
people don't know, like for example, some of the things that didn't work for us, right? It's what I tell when people say they want to start an infrastructure company, what should I do, right? Like yes. don't go about asking people if they want consistency, if they want transactions, if they want their data to be correct. They, depending on who they are, they're, they're going to say absolutely yes or absolutely no and neither means anything. Yes. Um, like, and people don't understand the nuances of limits of physics. Like when, when we say we're a distributed database, there's like, oh, you, you're distributed. Give me low, right, low, low, I mean, low latency yes. reads, writes, consistency, everything. But no, you can't do that. But I thought you said you're a high performance distributed database. Like, what do you mean you can't do that stuff though? So like, there's another whole area of education there. The third big realization, I mean, this one we realized a little early on, thanks to our experience with HBase and Cassandra is to never build a different API than what the world knows because it's hard mm. enough explaining what you did different about the database. It's incredibly hard if you're doing a different API, unless you're, of course, MongoDB, right? They, they're the only ones that were able to do it. But in some sense, you're, no, you're not building a database for the first 10 years. You're really evangelical about how to think about documents or whatever it is, right? So that's, that's been, I think that's real. I think so for us, we have two APIs and fortunately, um, so here's another tidbit, right? Like uh, one of the behind the scenes mistakes that we did kind of. Mm -hmm. we, we had three APIs, right? The third API was a, it was a simple API that we built only to make sure that we were able to build multiple APIs. And it was the Redis API because it's really simple. You just read off of a socket and you do stuff. And it, it works really well as a database, right? You know, um, Redis plus DB, you're going to mm -hmm. combine the two anyway. So we said like for the use cases where you don't have too many read operations, it's great. Why don't we just give you this thing in a, that thing got so complicated. Everything, everybody kept comparing it to a cache and asking questions about all sorts of craziness that Redis did. We said, you know what? We don't support this anymore. This is not an API available to you. There's only two APIs. That's it. So, got it. so yeah. So I, I have to update the, the encyclopedia because it says you're compatible with Cassandra, Postgres, and Redis. Yeah, we, we dropped it in our, I mean, we, yeah, we yes, tell people it's in maintenance mode, which is not something we're working on because it's just too much cognitive friction. All right. So I think... You, you could say that you could buy, well, again, your characterization so far, they sound like they're in the middle. They're not like, you know, tripping over their, over their own feet, but they're also not like, like the Volt DB people are quite sophisticated because most people don't need, you know, 5 million transactions a second. It's sort of like a, they're sort of self -loaded. You guys are sort of like, you know, I would say squarely in the middle, which yep. is, you should feel good about. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Awesome, guys. Uh, thank you again, Karthik. Thank you again for doing this. Really appreciate you spending your afternoon with us.